Chapter Seven of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: Your Money or Your Life. The noise which was made by the shutting of the door aroused Tom and Sarah from their reverie, and they rose and, having thanked the Chourineur for the information he had given them, the fellow went out. The wind blowing very strongly and the rain falling in torrents the schoolmaster and the chouette hidden in an alley opposite the tapis franc saw the chourineur go down the street in the direction of the street in which the house in ruins was situated his steps which were somewhat irregular in consequence of the frequent libations of the evening were soon unheard amidst the whistling of the storm and the sheets of rain which dashed against the walls sarah and tom left the tavern in spite of the tempest and took a contrary direction to the chourineur they're done for said the schoolmaster in a low key to the chouette out with your vitriol and mind your eye let us take off our shoes and then they won't hear us as we follow suggested the chouette you are right always right let us tread like cats my old darling the two monsters took off their shoes and moved stealthily along keeping in the shadows of the houses by means of this stratagem they followed so closely that although within a few steps of sarah and tom they did not hear them fortunately our hackney coach is at the end of the street the rain falls in torrents are you not cold sarah perhaps we shall glean something from this smuggler this bras rouge said sarah in a thoughtful tone and not replying to her brother's inquiry he suddenly stopped and said i have taken a wrong turning i ought to have gone to the right when i left the tavern we must pass by a house in ruins to reach the fiacre we must turn back the schoolmaster and the chouette who followed on the heels of their intended victims retreated into the dark porch of a house close at hand so that they might not be perceived by tom and sarah who in passing almost touched them with their elbows i am glad they have gone that way said the schoolmaster for if the cove resists i have my own idea sarah and her brother having again passed by the tapis franc arrived close to the dilapidated house which was partly in ruins and its open cellars formed a kind of gulf along which the street ran in that direction in an instant the schoolmaster with a leap resembling in strength and agility the spring of a tiger seized satan with one hand by the throat and exclaimed your money or i will fling you into this hole then the brigand pushing satan backwards shoved him off his balance and with one hand held him suspended over the mouth of the deep excavation whilst with his other hand he grasped the arm of sarah as if in a vice before tom could make the slightest struggle the chouette had emptied his pockets with singular dexterity sarah did not utter a cry nor try to resist she only said in a calm tone give up your purse brother and then accosting the robber we will make no noise do not do us any injury the chouette having carefully searched the pockets of the two victims of this ambush said to sarah let's see your hands if you've got any rings no said the old brute grumblingly no not one ring what a shame tom satan did not lose his presence of mind during this scene rapidly and unexpectedly as it had occurred will you strike a bargain my pocket-book contains papers quite useless to you return it to me and to-morrow i will give you twenty-five louis d'or said tom to the schoolmaster whose hand relaxed something of its fierce gripe oh ha to lay a trap to catch us replied the thief be off without looking behind you and be thankful that you have escaped so well one moment said the chouette if he behaves well he shall have his pocket-book there is a way then addressing thomas satan you know the plain of st denis i do do you know where st ouen is yes opposite st ouen at the end of the road of la revolte the plain is wide and open across the fields one may see a long way come there to-morrow quite alone with your money in your hand you will find me and the pocket-book ready hand me the cash and i will hand you the pocket-book but he'll trap you chouette oh no he won't i'm up to him or any of his dodges we can see a long way off i have only one eye but that is a piercer and if the cove comes with a companion he won't find anybody i shall have mizzled a sudden idea seemed to strike sarah and she said to the brigand 
will you like to gain some money yes did you see in the cabaret we have just left for i know you again the man whom the charcoal man came to seek a dandy with moustaches yes i would have stuck it into the fellow but he did not give me time he stunned me with two blows of his fists and upset me on the table for the first time that any man ever did so curses on him but i will be revenged he is the man i mean said sarah he cried the schoolmaster a thousand francs and i'll kill him wretch i do not seek his life replied sarah to the schoolmaster what then would you have come to-morrow to the plain of saint-denis you will there find my companion she replied you will see that he is alone and he will tell you what to do i will not give you one thousand but two thousand francs if you succeed fourline said the chouette in a low tone to the schoolmaster there's blunt to be had these are a swell lot who want to be revenged on an enemy and that enemy is the beggar that you wish to floor let's go and meet him i would go if i were you fire and smoke oh boy it will pay for looking after well my wife shall be there said the schoolmaster you will tell her what you want and i shall see be it so to-morrow at one at one o'clock in the plain of st denis in the plain of st denis between st ouen and the road of la revolte at the end of the road agreed i will bring your pocket-book and you shall have the five hundred francs i promised you and we will agree in the other matter if you are reasonable now you go to the right and we to the left hand do not follow us or else the schoolmaster and the chouette hurried off whilst tom and the countess went in the other direction towards notre dame a concealed witness had been present at this transaction it was the chourineur who had entered the cellars of the house to get shelter from the rain the proposal which sarah made to the brigand respecting rodolph deeply interested the chourineur who alarmed for the perils which appeared about to beset his new friend regretted that he could not warn him of them perhaps his detestation of the schoolmaster and the chouette might have something to do with this feeling the chourineur resolved to inform rodolph of the danger which threatened him but how he had forgotten the address of the self-styled fan-painter perhaps rodolph would never again come to the tapis franc and then how could he warn him whilst he was conning all this over in his mind the chourineur had mechanically followed tom and sarah and saw them get into a coach which awaited them near notre dame the fiacre started the chourineur got up behind and at one o'clock it stopped on the boulevard de l'observatoire and thomas and sarah went down a narrow entrance which was close at hand the night was pitch dark and the chourineur that he might know the next day the place where he then was drew from his pocket his clasp-knife and cut a deep notch in one of the trees at the corner of the entrance and then returned to his resting-place which was at a considerable distance for the first time for a very long while the chourineur enjoyed in his den a comfortable sleep which was not once interrupted by the horrible vision of the sergeant's slaughter-house as in his coarse language he styled it End of chapter seven chapter eight of the mysteries of paris volume one by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight the walk on the day after the evening on which the various events we have described had passed a bright autumnal sun shone from a pure sky the darkness of the night had wholly disappeared although always shaded by the height of the houses the disreputable neighbourhood into which the reader has followed us seemed less horrible when viewed in the light of open day when rodolph no longer feared meeting with the two persons whom he had evaded the overnight or did not care whether he faced them or not about eleven o'clock in the morning he entered the rue aux Fèves and directed his steps towards the tavern of the ogress rodolph was still in a workman's dress but there was a decided neatness in his costume his new blouse open on his chest showed a red woollen shirt closed by several silver buttons whilst the collar of another shirt of white cotton fell over a black silk cravat loosely tied around his neck from under his sky-blue velvet cap with a bright leather peak several locks of chestnut hair were seen and his boots cleaned very brightly and replacing the heavy iron shoes of the previous evening 
showed off to advantage a well-formed foot which seemed all the smaller from appearing out of a loose pantaloon of olive velveteen the costume was well calculated to display the elegant shape and carriage of rodolph which combined so much grace suppleness and power the ogress was airing herself at her door when rodolph presented himself young servant young man you have come no doubt for your change of the twenty francs she said with some show of respect not venturing to forget that the conqueror of the chourineur had handed her a louis d'or the previous evening there is seventeen francs ten sous coming to you but that's not all there was somebody here asking after you last night a tall gent well dressed and with him a young woman in men's clothes they drank my best wine along with the chourineur oh with the chourineur did they and what could they have to say to him when i say they drank i make a mistake they only just sipped a drain or so and but what did they say to the chourineur oh they talked of all manner of things of bras rouge and the rain and fine weather do they know bras rouge not by no means the chourineur told him all about him and as how as you well well that is not what i want to know you want your change yes and i want to take goualeuse to pass the day in the country oh that's impossible why why because she may never come back again her things belong to me not including as she owes me a matter of ninety francs as a balance for her board and lodging for the six weeks as she has lodged with me and if i didn't know her to be as honest a gal as is i should never let her go out of sight goualeuse owes you ninety francs ninety francs ten sous but what's that to you my lad are you a-going to come my lord and pay it for her yes said rodolph throwing five louis on the ogress's bar and what's your price for the clothes she wears the old hag amazed looked at the louis one after the other with an air of much doubt and mistrust what do you think i have given you bad money send and get change for one of them but make haste about it i say again how much for the garments the poor girl is wearing the ogress divided between her desire to make a good harvest her surprise to see a workman with so much money the fear of being cheated and the hopes of still greater gain was silent for an instant and then replied oh them things is well worth a hundred francs what those rags come now you shall keep the change from yesterday and i'll give you another louis and no more if i give you all i have i shall cheat the poor who ought to get some alms out of me well then my fine fellow i'll keep my things and goualeuse shan't go out i have a right to sell my things for what i choose may lucifer one day fry you as you deserve here's your money go and look for goualeuse the ogress pocketed the gold thinking that the workman had committed a robbery or received a legacy and then said with a nasty leer well indeed why not go upstairs and find goualeuse yourself she'll be very glad to see you for on my life she was much smitten with you yesterday do you go and fetch her and tell her i will take her into the country that's all you need to say not a word about my having paid you her debt why not what's that to you oh nothing it's no matter to me i would rather that she still believed herself in my clutch will you hold your tongue and do as i bid you oh what a cross creature you are i pity anybody who is under you well i'm going i'm going and the ogress went upstairs after a few minutes she came down again goualeuse would not believe me and really turned quite crimson when she knew you were here and when i told her that i would give her leave to pass the day in the country i thought she would have gone crazy for the first time in her life she was inclined to throw her arms about my neck that was her delight at leaving you fleur de marie entered at this moment dressed as she was the overnight with her gown of brown stuff her little orange shawl tied behind her and her handkerchief of red checks over her head leaving only two thick bands of light hair visible she blushed when she saw rodolph and looked down with a confused air would you like to pass the day in the country with me my lass asked rodolph very much indeed monsieur rodolph said goualeuse since madame gives me leave 
yes yes you may go my little duck because you're such a good gal come and kiss me afore you go and the old belle dame offered her bloated lips to fleur de marie the poor girl overcoming her disgust bent her forehead to the ogress but rodolph giving a sudden push with his elbow shoved the hag back on her seat took fleur de marie's arm and left the tapis franc amidst the loud maledictions of mother ponice mind monsieur rodolph said goualeuse the ogress will perhaps throw something at you she is very spiteful oh don't heed her my girl but what's the matter with you you seem embarrassed sad are you sorry for having come out with me oh dear no but but you give me your arm well and what of that you are a workman and some one may tell your master that they met you with me and harm may come of it masters do not like their workmen to be unsteady and goualeuse gently removed her arm from that of rodolph adding go on by yourself i will follow you to the barrier when we are once in the fields i can walk with you do not be uneasy said rodolph touched by the poor girl's consideration and taking her arm again my master does not live in this quarter and we shall find a coach on the quai aux fleurs as you please monsieur rodolph i only said so that you might not get into trouble i am sure of that and thank you very much but tell me is it all the same to you what part of the country we go into yes quite so monsieur rodolph so that it be in the country it is so fine and it is so nice to breathe the open air do you know that i have not been farther than the flower market for these six weeks and now if the ogress allows me to leave the cite she must have great confidence in me and when you came here was it to buy flowers oh no i had no money i only came to look at them and breathe their beautiful smell during the half hour which the ogress allowed me to pass on the quay on market days i was so happy that i forgot everything else and on returning to the ogress and those filthy streets oh why then i returned more sad than when i set out but i wiped my eyes that i might not be beaten for crying yet at the market what made me envious oh so envious was to see neat clean little workwomen who were going away so gaily with a beautiful pot of flowers in their hands i am sure that if you had had but a few flowers in your own window they would have kept you company what you say is quite true monsieur rodolph only imagine one day on her birthday the ogress knowing my taste gave me a little rose tree if you only knew how happy it made me i was never tired of looking at it my own rose tree i counted its leaves its flowers but the air of the cite is bad and it began to wither in two days then but you'll laugh at me monsieur rodolph no no go on well then i asked the ogress to let me go out and take my rose tree for a walk as i would have taken a child out well then i carried it to the quay thinking that to be with other flowers in the fresh and balmy air would do it good i bathed its poor fading leaves in the clear waters of the fountain and then to dry it i placed it for a full quarter of an hour in the sun dear little rose tree it never saw the sun in the cite any more than i did for in our streets it never descends lower than the roof at last i went back again and i assure you monsieur rodolph that thanks to these walks my rose tree lived at least ten days longer than it would have done had i not taken such pains with it no doubt of it but when it died what a loss it must have been to you i cried heartily for it grieved me very very much and you see monsieur rodolph for you know one loves flowers although one hasn't any of one's own you see i felt grateful to it that dear rose tree for blooming so kindly for me although i was so goualeuse bent her head and blushed deeply unhappy child with this feeling of your own position you must often have desired to end it you mean sir said goualeuse interrupting her companion yes yes more than once a month ago i looked over the parapet at the seine but then when i looked at the flowers and the sun then i said the river will always be there i am but sixteen and a half who knows when you said who knows you had hope yes and what did you hope to find some charitable soul who would get me work so that i might be enabled to leave the ogress and this hope comforted me then i said to myself i am very wretched 
but i have never injured anybody and if i had any one to advise me i should not be as i am this lightened my sorrow a little though it had greatly increased at the loss of my rose tree added goualeuse with a sigh always so very sad yes but look here it is and goualeuse took from her pocket a little bundle of wood trimmed very carefully and tied with a rose-coloured bow what have you kept it i have indeed it is all i possess in the world what have you nothing else nothing this coral necklace belongs to the ogress and you have not a piece of ribbon a cap or handkerchief no nothing nothing but the dead branches of my poor rose tree and that is why i love it so when rodolph and goualeuse had reached the quai aux fleurs a coach was waiting there into which rodolph handed goualeuse he got in himself saying to the driver to st denis i will tell you presently which road to take the coach went on the sun was bright and the sky cloudless whilst the air fresh and crisp circulated freely through the open windows here's a woman's cloak said goualeuse remarking that she had seated herself on a garment without having at first noticed it yes it is for you my child i brought it with me for fear you should be cold little accustomed to such attention the poor girl looked at rodolph with surprise mon dieu monsieur rodolph how kind you are i am really ashamed because i am kind no but you do not speak as you did yesterday you appear quite another person tell me then fleur de marie which do you like best the rodolph of yesterday or the rodolph of to-day i like you better now yet yesterday i seemed to be more your equal then as if correcting herself and fearing to have annoyed rodolph she said to him when i say your equal monsieur rodolph i do not mean that i can ever be that one thing in you astonishes me very much fleur de marie and what is that monsieur rodolph you appear to have forgotten that the chouette said to you yesterday that she knew the persons who had brought you up oh i have not forgotten it i thought of it all night and i cried bitterly but i am sure it is not true she invented this tale to make me unhappy yet the chouette may know more than you think if it were so should you not be delighted to be restored to your parents alas sir if my parents never loved me what should i gain by discovering them they would only see me and but if they did ever love me what shame i should bring on them perhaps i should kill them if your parents ever loved you fleur de marie they will pity pardon and still love you if they have abandoned you then when they see the frightful destiny to which they have brought you their shame and remorse will avenge you what is the good of vengeance you are right let us talk no more on the subject at this moment the carriage reached st ouen where the road divides to st denis and the revolte in spite of the monotony of the landscape fleur de marie was so delighted at seeing the fields as she called them that forgetting the sad thoughts which the recollection of the chouette had awakened in her her lovely countenance grew radiant with delight she leaned out of the window clasping her hands and crying monsieur rodolphe how happy i am grass fields may i get out it is so fine i should so like to run in the meadows let us run then my child coachman stop what you too will you run monsieur rodolphe i'm having a holiday oh what pleasure and rodolphe and goualeuse taking each other's hand ran as fast as they could over a long piece of latter grass just mowed it would be impossible to describe the leaps and exclamations of joy the intense delight of fleur de marie poor lamb so long a prisoner she inspired the free air with indescribable pleasure she ran returned stopped and then raced off again with renewed happiness at the sight of the daisies and buttercups goualeuse could not restrain her transport she did not leave one flower which she could gather after having run about in this way for some time she became rather tired for she had lost the habit of exercise and stopped to take breath sitting down on the trunk of a fallen tree which was lying at the edge of a deep ditch the clear and white complexion of fleur de marie generally rather pale was now heightened by the brightest colour her large blue eyes sparkled brightly her vermilion lips partly opened to recover her breath 
displayed two rows of liquid pearls her bosom throbbed under her worn-out little orange shawl and she placed one of her hands upon her heart as if to restrain its quickened pulsation whilst with the other hand she preferred to rodolph the bouquet of field flowers which she had just gathered nothing could be more charming than the combination of innocence and pure joy which beamed on her expressive countenance when fleur de marie could speak she said to rodolph with an accent of supreme happiness and of gratitude almost amounting to piety how good is the great god to give us so fine a day a tear came into rodolph's eye when he heard this poor forsaken despised lost creature utter a cry of happiness and deep gratitude to the creator because she enjoyed a ray of sunshine and the sight of a green field he was roused from his reverie by an unexpected occurrence End of chapter eight chapter nine of the mysteries of paris volume one by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter nine the surprise we have said that goualeuse was sitting on the trunk of a fallen tree at the edge of a deep ditch suddenly a man springing up from the bottom of this hollow shook the rubbish from him under which he had concealed himself and burst into a loud fit of laughter goualeuse turned around screaming with alarm it was the chourineur don't be frightened my girl said the chourineur when he saw her extreme fear and that she had sought protection from her companion ah master rodolph here's a curious meeting which i am sure neither you nor i expected then he added in a serious tone listen master people may say what they like but there is something in the air there up there above our heads very wonderful which seems to say to a man go where i send you see how you two have been sent here it is devilish wonderful what are you doing there said rodolph greatly surprised i was on the lookout in a matter of yours master but thunder and lightning what a high joke that you should come at this particular moment into this very neighbourhood of my country house there's something in all this decidedly there is something but again i ask you what are you doing there all in good time i'll tell you only let me first look about me for a moment the chourineur then ran towards the coach which was some distance off looked this way and that way over the plain with a keen and rapid glance and then rejoined rodolph running quickly will you explain to me the meaning of all this patience patience good master one word more what's a clock half past twelve said rodolph looking at his watch all right we have time then the chouette will not be here for the next half hour the chouette cried rodolph and the girl both at once yes the chouette in two words master i'll tell you all yesterday after you had left the tapis franc there came a tall man with a woman in man's attire who asked for me i know all about that but then then they paid for my liquor and wanted to draw me about you i had nothing to tell them because you had communicated nothing to me except those fisticuffs which settled me all i know is that i learned something then which i shall not easily forget but we are friends for life and death master rodolph though the devil burn me if i know why i feel for you in the regard which the bulldog feels for his master it was after you told me that i had heart and honour but that's nothing so there's an end of it it is no use trying to account for it so it is and so let it be if it's any good to you many thanks my man but go on the tall man and the little lady in men's clothes finding that they could not get nothing out of me left the ogresses and so did i then going towards the palais de justice and i to notre dame on reaching the end of the street i found it was raining pitchforks points downward a complete deluge there was an old house in ruins close at hand and i said to myself if this shower is to last all night i shall sleep as well here as in my own crib so i rolled myself into a sort of cave where i was high and dry my bed was an old beam and my pillow a heap of lath and plaster and there i slept like a king well well go on we had drank together master rodolph 
i had drank too with the tall man and the little woman dressed in man's clothes so you may believe my head was rather heavy and besides nothing sends me off to sleep like a good fall of rain i began to snooze but i had not been long asleep i think when aroused by a noise i sat up and listened i heard the schoolmaster who was talking in a friendly tone with somebody i soon made out that he was parleying with the tall man who came into the tapis franc with the little woman dressed in man's clothes they in conference with the schoolmaster and the chouette said rodolph with amazement with the schoolmaster and the chouette and they agreed to meet again on the morrow that's to-day said rodolph at what o'clock this very moment where the road branches off to st denis and la revolte this very spot just as you say master rodolph on this very spot the schoolmaster oh pray be on your guard monsieur rodolph exclaimed fleur de marie don't be alarmed my child he won't come it's only the chouette how could the man who with a female in disguise sought me at the tapis franc come into contact with these two wretches said rodolph a faith i don't know and i think i only awoke at the end of the affair for the tall man was talking of getting back his pocket-book which the chouette was to bring here in exchange for five hundred francs i should say that the schoolmaster had begun by robbing him and that it was after that that they began to parley and to come to friendly terms it is very strange mon dieu it makes me quite frightened on your account monsieur rodolph said fleur de marie master rodolph is no chicken girl but as you say there may be something working against him and so i am here go on my good fellow the tall man and the little woman have promised two thousand francs to the schoolmaster to do to you i don't know what the chouette is to be here directly to return the pocket-book and to know what is required from them which she is to tell the schoolmaster who will undertake it fleur de marie started rodolph smiled disdainfully two thousand francs to do something to you master rodolph that makes me think that when i see a notice of a dog that has been lost i don't mean to make a comparison and the offer of a hundred francs reward for his discovery i say to myself animal if you were lost no one would give a hundred farthings to find you two thousand francs to do something to you who are you then i'll tell you by and by that's enough master when i heard this proposal i said to myself i must find out where these two dons live who want to set the schoolmaster on the haunches of monsieur rodolph it may be serviceable so when they had gone away i got out of my hiding-place and followed them quietly i saw the tall man and little woman get into a coach near notre dame and i got up behind and we went on until we reached the boulevard de l'observatoire it was as dark as the mouth of an oven and i could not distinguish anything so i cut a notch in a tree that i might find out the place in the morning well thought of my good fellow this morning i went there and about ten yards from the tree i saw a narrow entrance closed by a gate in the mud there were little and large footsteps and at the end of the entrance a small garden gate where the traces ended so the roosting place of the tall man and the little woman must be there thanks my worthy friend you have done me a most essential piece of service without knowing it i beg your pardon master rodolph but i believed i was serving you and that was the reason i did as i did i know it my fine fellow and i wish i could recompense your service more properly than by thanks but unfortunately i am only a poor devil of a workman although you say they offer two thousand francs for something to be done against me i will explain that to you yes if you like but not unless somebody threatens you with something and i will come across them if i can the rest is your affair i know what they want listen to me i have a secret for cutting fans in ivory by a mechanical process but this secret does not belong to me alone i am awaiting my comrade to go to work and no doubt it is the model of the machine which i have at home that they are desirous of getting from me at any price for there is a great deal of money to be made by this discovery the tall man and the little woman then are workpeople with whom i have been associated and to whom i have refused my secret 
this explanation appeared satisfactory to the chourineur whose apprehension was not the clearest in the world and he replied now i understand it all the beggars you see they have not the courage to do their dirty tricks themselves but to come to the end of my story i said to myself this morning i know the rendezvous of the chouette and the tall man i will go there and wait for them i have good legs and my employer will wait for me i came here and found this hole and taking an armful of stuff from the dunghill yonder i hid myself here up to my nose and waited for the chouette but lo and behold you came into the field and poor goualeuse came and sat down on the very edge of my park and then i determined to have a bit of fun and jumping out of my lair i called out like a man on fire and now what do you propose to do to wait for the chouette who is sure to come first to try and overhear what she and the tall man talk about for that may be useful for you to know there is nothing in the field but this trunk of a tree and from here you may see all over the plain it is as if it were made on purpose to sit down upon the rendezvous of the chouette is only four steps off at the cross-road and i will lay a bet they come and sit here when they arrive if i cannot hear anything then as soon as they separate i will follow the chouette who is sure to stay last and i'll pay her the old grudge i owe her for the goualeuse's tooth and i'll twist her neck until she tells me the name of the parents of the poor girl for she says she knows them what do you think of my idea master rodolph i like it very well my lad but there is one part which you must alter oh chourineur do not get yourself into any quarrel on my account if you beat the chouette then the schoolmaster say no more my lass the chouette will not go scot-free for me confound it why for the very reason that the schoolmaster will defend her i will double her dose listen my man to me i have a better plan for avenging the chouette's brutalities to goualeuse which i will tell you hereafter now said rodolph moving a few paces from goualeuse and speaking low now will you render me a real service name it master rodolph the chouette does not know you i saw her yesterday for the first time at the tapis franc this is what you must do hide yourself first but when you see her come close to you get out of this hole and twist her neck no defer that for a time to-day only prevent her from speaking to the tall man he seeing some one with her will not approach and if he does do not leave her alone for a moment he cannot make his proposal before you if the man thinks me curious i know what to do he is neither the schoolmaster nor master rodolph i will follow the chouette like her shadow and the man shall not say a word that i do not overhear he will then be off and after that i will have one little turn with the chouette i must have it it will be such a sweet drop for me not yet the one-eyed hag does not know whether you are a thief or not no not unless the schoolmaster has talked of me to her and i told her that i did not do business in that line if he have he must appear to have altered your ideas on that subject i yes ten thousand thunders monsieur rodolph what do you mean indeed truly i don't like it it does not suit me to play such a farce as that you shall only do what you please but you will not find that i shall suggest any infamous plan to you the tall man once driven away you must try and talk over the chouette as she will be very savage at having missed the good haul she expected you must try and smooth her down by telling her that you know of a capital bit of business which may be done and that you are then waiting for your comrade and that if the schoolmaster will join you there is a lump of money to be made well well after waiting with her for an hour you may say my mate does not come and so the job must be put off and then you may make an appointment with the chouette and the schoolmaster for to-morrow at an early hour do you understand me quite and this evening at ten o'clock meet me at the corner of the champs elysees and the allée des veuves and i will tell you more if it is a trap look out the schoolmaster is a scoundrel you have beaten him and no doubt he will kill you if he can have no fear by jove it is a rum start but do as you like with me 
i do not hesitate for something tells me that there is a rod and pickle for the schoolmaster and the chouette one word though if you please monsieur rodolph say it i do not think you are the man to lay a trap and set the police on the schoolmaster he is an arrant blackguard who deserves a hundred deaths but to have them arrested that i will not have a hand in nor i my boy but i have a score to wipe off with him and the chouette because they are in a plot with others against me but we two will baffle them completely if you will lend me your assistance of course i will and if that is to be the game i am your man but quick quick cried the chourineur down there i see the head of the chouette i know it is her bonnet go go and i will drop into my hole to-night then at ten o'clock at the corner of the champs elysees and the allée des veuves all right fleur de marie had not heard a word of the latter part of the conversation between the chourineur and rodolph and now entered again into the coach with her travelling companion End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One, by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten, Castles in the Air. For some time after this conversation with the Chourineur, Rodolph remained preoccupied and pensive, while Fleur de Marie, too timid to break the silence, continued to gaze on him with saddened earnestness. At length, Rodolph looked up and, meeting her mournful look, smiled kindly on her and said what are you thinking of my child i fear our rencontre with the chourineur has made you uncomfortable and we were so merry too oh no monsieur rodolph indeed i do not mind it at all nay i even believe the meeting with the chourineur may be useful to you did not this man pass amongst the inhabitants of the tapis franc as possessing some good points among his many bad ones indeed i know not monsieur rodolph for although previously to the scene of yesterday i had frequently seen him i had scarcely ever spoken to him i always looked upon him as bad as all the rest well well do not let us talk any more about him my pretty fleur de marie i should be sorry indeed to make you sad i who brought you out purposely that you might spend a happy day oh i am happy it is so very long since i have been out of paris not since your grand doings with rigolette yes indeed monsieur rodolph but that was in the spring yet though it is now autumn i enjoy it quite as much how beautifully the sun shines only look at the gold-coloured clouds out there there i mean and then that hill with its pretty white houses half hid among the trees and the leaves still so green though we are in the middle of the month of october do you not think it is wonderful monsieur rodolph they should so well preserve their verdure in paris all the leaves wither so soon look look at those pigeons how many there are and how high they fly now they are settling on that old mill one is never tired in the open fields of looking at all these amusing sights it is indeed a pleasure to behold the delight you seem to take in all these trifling matters fleur de marie though they in reality constitute the charm of a landscape and rodolph was right for the countenance of his companion while gazing upon the fair calm scene before her who was lit up with an expression of the purest joy see she exclaimed after intently watching the different objects that unfolded themselves to her eager look see how beautifully the clear white smoke rises from those cottages and ascends to the very clouds themselves and there are some men ploughing the land what a capital plough they have got drawn by those two fine grey horses oh if i were a man how i should like to be a husbandman to go out into the fields and drive one's own plough and then when you look to see the blue skies and the green shiny leaves of the neighbouring forests such a day as to-day for instance when you feel half inclined to weep without knowing why and begin singing old and melancholy songs like geneviève de brabant do you know geneviève de brabant monsieur rodolphe no my child but i hope you will have the kindness to sing it to me before the day is over you know our time is all our own at these words which reminded the poor goualeuse that her newly tasted happiness was fast fleeting away and that at the close of this the brightest day that had ever shone on her existence 
she must return to all the horrors of a corrupt city her feelings broke through all restraint she hid her face in her hands and burst into tears much surprised at her emotion rodolph kindly inquired its cause what ails you fleur de marie what fresh grief have you found nothing nothing indeed monsieur rodolph replied the girl drying her eyes and trying to smile pray forgive me for being so sad and please not to notice it i assure you i have nothing at all to grieve about it is only a fancy and now i am going to be quite gay you will see and you were as gay as could be a few minutes ago yes i know i was and it was my thinking how soon answered fleur de marie naively and raising her large tearful blue eyes with touching candour to his face the look the words fully enlightened rodolph as to the cause of her distress and wishing to dissipate it he said smilingly i would lay a wager you are regretting your poor rose-tree and are crying because you could not bring it out walking with you as you used to do la goualeuse fell into the good-natured scheme for regaining her cheerfulness and by degrees the clouds of sadness cleared away from her fair young face and once again she appeared absorbed in the pleasure of the moment without allowing herself to recollect the future that would succeed it the vehicle had by this time almost arrived at st denis and the tall spires of the cathedral were visible oh what a fine steeple exclaimed la goualeuse it is that of the splendid church of st denis would you like to see it we can easily stop our carriage poor fleur de marie cast down her eyes from the hour i went to live with the ogress said she in a low tone while deep blushes dyed her cheek i never once entered a church i durst not when in prison on the contrary i used to delight in helping to sing the mass and against the fete de dieu oh i made such lovely bouquets for the altar but god is merciful and good why then fear to pray to him or to enter his holy church oh no no monsieur rodolph i have offended god deeply enough let me not add impiety and sacrilege to my sins after a moment's silence rodolph again renewed the conversation and kindly taking the hand of la goualeuse said fleur de marie tell me honestly have you ever known what it is to love never monsieur rodolph and how do you account for this you saw the kind of persons who frequented the tapis franc and then to love the object should be good and virtuous why do you think so oh because one's lover or husband would be all in all to us and we should seek no greater happiness than devoting our life to him but monsieur rodolph if you please we will talk of something else for the tears will come into my eyes willingly fleur de marie let us change the conversation and now tell me why do you look so beseechingly at me with those large tearful eyes have i done anything to displease you on the contrary tis the excess of your goodness that makes me weep indeed i could almost fancy that you had brought me out solely for my individual pleasure and enjoyment without thinking of yourself not content with your generous defence of me yesterday you have to-day procured for me happiness such as i never hoped to enjoy you are then truly and entirely happy never never shall i forget to-day happiness does not often attend us on earth said rodolph sighing alas no seldom perhaps never for my own part to make up for a want of reality in its possession i often amuse myself with pictures of what i would have if i could saying to myself this is how and where i should like to live this is the sort of income i should like to enjoy have you never my little fleur de marie amused yourself with building similar castles in the air yes formerly when i was in prison before i went to live with the ogress then i used to do nothing all day but dance sing and build these fairy dreams but i very seldom do so now tell me monsieur rodolph if you could have any wish you liked what should you most desire oh i should like to be rich with plenty of servants and carriages to possess a splendid hotel and to mix in the first circles of fashion to be able to obtain any amusement i pleased and to go to the theatres and opera whenever i chose well then you would be more unreasonable than i should now i will tell you exactly what would satisfy me in every respect first of all sufficient money to clear myself with the ogress 
and to keep me till i could obtain work for my future support then a pretty little nice clean room all to myself from the window of which i could see the trees while i sat at my work plenty of flowers in your casement of course oh certainly and if it could be managed to live in the country always and that i think is all i should want let me see a little room and work enough to maintain you those are positive necessaries but when one is merely wishing there is no harm in adding a few superfluities should you not like such nice things as carriages diamonds and rich clothes not at all all i wish for is my free and undisturbed liberty a country life and the certainty of not dying in a hospital oh that idea is dreadful above all things i would desire the certainty of its never being my fate oh monsieur rodolphe that dread often comes across me and fills me with terror alas poor folks such as we are should not shrink from such things tis not the dying in a charitable institution i dread or the poverty that would send me into it but the thoughts of what they do to your lifeless remains what do they do that shocks you so much is it possible monsieur rodolphe you have never been told what will become of you if you die in one of those places no indeed i have not do you tell me well then i knew a young girl who had been a sort of companion to me when i was in prison she afterwards died in a hospital and what do you think her body was given to the surgeons for dissection murmured the shuddering fleur de marie that is indeed a frightful idea and do these miserable anticipations often trouble you my poor girl ah monsieur rodolphe it surprises you that after my unhappy life i can feel any concern as to what becomes of my miserable remains god knows the feeling which makes me shrink from such an outrage to modesty is all my wretched fate has left me the mournful tone in which these words were uttered and the bitter feelings they contained went to the heart of rodolphe but his companion quickly perceiving his air of dejection and blaming herself for having caused it said timidly monsieur rodolphe i feel that i am behaving very ill and ungratefully towards you who so kindly brought me out to amuse me and give me pleasure in return for which i only keep talking to you about all the dull and gloomy things i can think of i wonder how i can do so to be able even to recollect my misery when all around me smiles and looks so gay i cannot tell how it is words seem to rise from my lips in spite of myself and though i feel happier to-day than i ever did before in my life my eyes are continually filling with tears you are not angry with me are you monsieur rodolphe see too my sadness is going away as suddenly as it came there now it is all gone and shall not return to vex you any more i am determined look monsieur rodolphe just look at my eyes they do not show that i have been crying do they and here fleur de marie having repeatedly closed her eyes to get rid of the rebellious tears that would gather there opened them full upon rodolphe with a look of most enchanting candour and sweetness put no restraint on yourself i beseech you fleur de marie be gay if you really feel so or sad if sadness most suits your present state of mind i have my own hours of gloom and melancholy and my sufferings would be much increased were i compelled to feign a lightness of heart i did not really possess can it be possible monsieur rodolphe that you are ever sad quite possible my child and true alas the prospect before me is but little brighter than your own i like you am without friends or parents what would become of me if i were to fall ill and be unable to earn my daily bread for i need scarcely tell you i live but from day to day and spend my money quite as fast as i obtain it oh but that is wrong monsieur rodolphe very very wrong said la goualeuse in a tone of such deep and grave remonstrance as made him smile you should always lay by something look at me why all my troubles and misfortunes have happened because i did not save my money more carefully if once a person can get a hundred francs beforehand he need never fear falling into any one's power generally a difficulty about money puts very evil thoughts into our head all that is very wise and very sensible my frugal little friend but a hundred francs that is a large sum how could a man like myself ever amass so much 
why monsieur rodolph it is really very easy if you will but consider a little first of all i think you said you could earn five francs a day yes so i can when i choose to work ah but you should work constantly and regularly and yours is such a pretty trade to paint fans how nice such work must be mere amusement quite a recreation i cannot think why you should ever be tired or dull indeed monsieur rodolph i must tell you plainly i do not pity you at all and besides really you talk like a mere child when you say you cannot save money out of such large earnings added la goualeuse in a sweet but for her severe tone why a workman may live well upon three francs a day there remain forty sous at the end of the month if you manage prudently you will have saved sixty francs think of that there's a sum sixty francs in one month oh but one likes to show off sometimes and to indulge in a little idleness there now monsieur odolph i declare you make me quite angry to hear you talk so childishly pray let me advise you to be wiser come then my sage little monitress i will be a good boy and listen to all your careful advice and your idea of saving too is a remarkably good one i never thought of it before really exclaimed the poor girl clapping her hands with joy oh if you knew how delighted i am to hear you say so then you will begin from to-day to lay the forty sous we were talking about will you will you indeed i give you my honour that from this very hour i will resolve to follow up your most excellent plan and save forty sous out of each day's pay are you quite quite sure you will nay have i not promised you that i will you will see how proud and happy you will be with your first savings and that is not all ah if you would promise not to be angry do i look as though i could be so unkind fleur de marie as to find fault with anything you said oh no indeed that you do not only i hardly know whether i ought you ought to tell me everything you think or feel fleur de marie well then i was wondering how you who it is easily seen are above your condition can frequent such low cabarets as that kept by the ogress had i not done so i should not have had the pleasure of wandering in the fields with you to-day my dear fleur de marie that is indeed true monsieur rodolph but still it does not alter my first opinion no much as i enjoy to-day's treat i would cheerfully give up all thoughts of ever passing such another if i thought it could in any way injure you injure me far from it think of the excellent advice you have been giving me which you have promised me to follow i have and i pledge my word of honour to save henceforward at least forty sous a day thus speaking rodolph called out to the driver of their vehicle who was passing the village of sarcelles take the first road to the right cross villiers to bell turn to the left then keep along quite straight now said rodolph turning to his companion that i am a good boy and promise to do all you tell me let us go back to our diversion of building castles in the air that does not run away with much money you will not object to such a method of amusing myself will you oh no build as many as you like they are very cheaply raised and very easily knocked down when you are tired of them now then you begin well then no fleur de marie you shall build up yours first i wonder if you could guess what i should choose if wishing were all monsieur rodolph let us try suppose that this road i say this road because we happen to be on it yes yes of course this road is as good as any other well then i say i suppose that this road leads to a delightful little village at a considerable distance from the high road oh yes that makes it so much more still and quiet it is built facing the south and half surrounded by trees and close by flows a gentle river exactly a clear gently flowing river at the end of this village stands a pretty farm with a nice orchard on one side of it and a garden filled with flowers on the other that farm shall be called my farm to which we will pretend we are now going just so and where we know we shall get some delicious milk to drink after our journey milk indeed excellent cream and newly laid eggs if you please and where we would be glad to stay all our lives all our lives quite right go on and then we should go and see all the cows to be sure we should 
and afterwards visit the dairy visit the dairy yes then the pigeon house yes so we should oh how very very nice only to think of such things but let me finish the description of the farm yes pray do i quite forgot that well then the ground floor contains two rooms one a large kitchen for the farm servants and the other for the owner of the place make that room have green blinds monsieur rodolph do pray they are so cool and look so pretty yes yes green blinds to the windows i quite agree with you they do look uncommonly pretty and set off a place so well of course the person tenanting this farm is your aunt of course she is my aunt and a very good sensible kind woman monsieur rodolph is she not particularly so and loves you like her own child dear good aunt oh how delightful to have some one to love us and you return the tender affection she bears you oh with all my heart exclaimed fleur de marie clasping her hands and raising her eyes to heaven with an expression impossible to describe and i should help her to work to attend to the family linen to keep everything neat and clean to store up the summer fruits against winter oh she would never have to complain that i was idle i promise first of all in the morning wait a bit fleur de marie you are in too great a hurry i want to finish describing the house to you never mind your aunt just yet Aha, mr painter all this is taken from some pretty landscape you have been painting on a fan now i know what makes you so expert at describing it said la goualeuse laughing merrily at her own little jest you little chatterer be quiet will you yes i am a chatterer indeed to interrupt you so often monsieur rodolph but pray go on and i will not speak again till you have finished painting this dear farm your room is on the first floor my room how charming oh go on go on please monsieur rodolph and describe all about it to me and the delighted girl opened her large laughing eyes and pressed more closely against rodolph as if she expected to see the picture in his hand your chamber has two windows looking out upon the flower garden and a small meadow watered by the river we mentioned on the opposite bank of the stream rises a small hill planted with fine old chestnut trees and from amongst them peeps out the village church oh how beautiful how very beautiful monsieur rodolph it makes one quite long to be there three or four fine cows are grazing in the meadow which is only separated from the garden by a hedge of honeysuckle and from my windows i can see the cows perfectly and one among them ought to be my favourite you know monsieur rodolph and i ought to put a little bell around its neck and use it to feed out of my hands of course she would come when you call her let me see what name shall we give her suppose we say musette do you like that she shall be very young and gentle and entirely white oh what a pretty name musette ah musette musette i shall be always feeding you and patting you to make you know me now we will finish the inside of your apartment fleur de marie the curtains and furniture are green like the blinds and outside the window grow an enormous rose-tree and honeysuckle which entirely cover this side of the farm and so surround your casements that you have only to stretch out your hand to gather a large bunch of roses and honeysuckle wet with the early morning dew ah monsieur rodolph what a good painter you are now this is the way you will pass your day yes yes let us see how i shall employ myself all day early in the morning your good aunt wakes you with a tender kiss she brings with her a bowl of new milk just warm which she prays you to drink as she fancies you are delicate about the lungs poor dear child well you do as she wishes you then rise and take a walk around the farm pay a visit to musette the poultry your pets the pigeons the flowers in the garden till nine o'clock when your writing-master arrives my writing-master why you know unless you learn such necessary things as reading writing and accounts you would not be able to assist your aunt to keep her books relative to the produce of the farm oh to be sure how very stupid of me not to recollect that i must learn to write well if i wish to help my aunt cried the young girl 
so thoroughly absorbed in the picture of this peaceful life as to believe for the moment in its reality after your lesson is concluded you will occupy yourself in household matters or embroider some pretty little article of address for yourself then you will practise your writing for an hour or two and when that is done join your aunt in her round of visits to the different operations of the farm in the summer to see how the reapers get on in the hayfield in harvest time to observe the reapers and afterwards to enjoy the delight with which the gleaners pick up the scattered ears of grain by this time you will have almost tired yourself and gathering a large handful of wild herbs carefully selected by you as the known favourites of your dear musette you turn your steps homewards but we go back through the meadow dear monsieur rodolph do we not inquired la goualeuse as earnestly as though every syllable her ears drank in was to be effectually brought to pass oh yes by all means and there happens fortunately to be a nice little bridge by which the river separating the farmland from the meadow may be crossed by the time you reach home upon my word it is seven o'clock and as the evenings begin to be a little chill a bright cheerful fire is blazing in the large farm kitchen you go in there for a few minutes just to warm yourself and to speak a few kind words to the honest labourers who are enjoying a hearty meal after the day's toil is over then you sit down to dinner with your aunt sometimes the curé or a neighbouring farmer is invited to share the meal after dinner you read or work while your aunt and her guest have a friendly game at piquet at ten o'clock she dismisses you with a kiss and a blessing to your chamber you retire to your room offer prayers and thanksgivings to the great author of all your happiness then sleep soundly till morning when the same routine begins again oh monsieur rodolph one might lead such a life as that for a hundred years without ever knowing one moment's weariness but that is not all there are sundays and fete days to be thought of yes and how shall we pass those why you would put on your holiday dress with one of those pretty little caps a la paysanne which all admit you look so very nicely in and accompany your aunt in her large old-fashioned chaise driven by james the farm servant to hear mass in the village church after which during summer your kind relative would take you to the different fete given in the adjoining parishes you so gentle so modest and good-looking so tenderly beloved by your aunt and so well spoken of by the curé for all the virtues and qualifications which make a good wife will have no scarcity of offers for your hand in the dance indeed all the principal young farmers will be anxious to secure you as a partner by way of opening an acquaintance which shall last for life by degrees you begin to remark one more than the others you perceive his deep desire to attract your undivided attention and so and here rodolph struck by the continued silence of la goualeuse looked up at her alas the poor girl was endeavouring though fruitlessly to choke the deep sobs which almost suffocated her for a brief period carried away by the words of rodolph the bright future presented to her mental vision had effaced the horrible present but too quickly did the hideous picture return and sweep away for ever the dear delight of believing so sweet so calm an existence could ever be hers fleur de marie asked rodolph in a kind and affectionate tone why is this why these tears ah monsieur rodolph you have unintentionally caused me much pain foolish girl that i was i had listened to you till i quite fancied this paradise were a true picture and so it is my dear child this paradise as you call it is no fiction stop coachman now look see observe where we are as the carriage stopped la goualeuse at rodolph's bidding mechanically raised her head they were on the summit of a little hill what was her surprise her astonishment at the scene which revealed itself to her gaze the pretty village built facing the south the farm the meadow the beautiful cows the little winding river the chestnut grove the church in the distance the whole picture so vividly painted was before her eyes nothing was wanting even the milk-white heifer musette her future pet was peacefully grazing as she had been described the rich colouring of an october sun gilded the charming landscape while the variegated tint of the chestnut leaves slightly tinged by the autumnal breezes stood out in bold relief against the clear blue of the surrounding sky 
well my little fleur de marie what do you say to this am i a good painter or not la goualeuse looked at him with a surprise in which a degree of uneasiness was mingled all she saw and heard appeared to her to partake largely of the supernatural monsieur rodolph she at length exclaimed with a bewildered look how can this be indeed indeed i feel afraid to look at it it is so exactly alike i cannot believe it is anything but a dream you have conjured up and which will quickly pass away speak to me pray do and tell me what to believe calm yourself my dear child nothing is more simple or true than what you behold here the good woman who owns this farm was my nurse and brought me up here intending to give myself a treat i sent to her early this morning to say i was coming to see her you see i painted after nature you are quite right monsieur rodolph sighed la goualeuse there is indeed nothing but what is quite natural in all this the farm to which rodolph had conducted fleur de marie was situated at the outer extremity of the village of bouqueval a small isolated and unknown hamlet entirely surrounded by its own lands and about two leagues distance from Ecoin. the vehicle following the directions of rodolph rapidly descended the hill and entered a long avenue bordered with apple and cherry trees while the wheels rolled noiselessly over the short fine grass with which the unfrequented road was overgrown fleur de marie whose utmost efforts were unavailing to shake off the painful sensations she experienced remained so silent and mournful that rodolph reproached himself with having by his well-intentioned surprise been the cause of it in a few moments more the carriage passing by the large entrance to the farm entered a thick avenue of elm trees and stopped before a little rustic porch half hidden by the luxuriant branches of the vine which clustered round it now fleur de marie here we are are you pleased with what you see indeed i am monsieur rodolph but how shall i venture before the good person you mentioned as living here pray do not let her see me i cannot venture to approach her and why my child true monsieur rodolph i forget she does not know me and will not guess how unworthy i am and poor fleur de marie tried to suppress the deep sigh that would accompany her words the arrival of rodolph had no doubt been watched for the driver had scarcely opened the carriage door when a prepossessing female of middle age dressed in the style of wealthy landholders about paris and whose countenance though melancholy was also gentle and benevolent in its expression appeared in the porch and with respectful eagerness advanced to meet rodolph poor goualeuse felt her cheeks flush and her heart beat as she timidly descended from the vehicle good day good day madame georges said rodolph advancing towards the individual so addressed you see i am punctual then turning to the driver and putting money into his hand he said here my friend there is no further occasion to detain you you may return to paris as soon as you please the coachman a little short square-built man with his hat over his eyes and his countenance almost entirely concealed by the high collar of his driving-coat pocketed the money without a word remounted his seat gave his horses the whip and disappeared down the allée verte by which he had entered fleur de marie sprang to the side of rodolph and with an air of unfeigned alarm almost amounting to distress said in a tone so low as not to be overheard by madame georges monsieur rodolph monsieur rodolph pray do not be angry but why have you sent away the carriage will it not return to fetch us away of course not i have quite done with the man and therefore dismissed him but the ogress what of her why do you mention her name alas alas because i must return to her this evening indeed indeed i must or or she will consider me a thief the very clothes i have on are hers and besides i owe her make yourself quite easy my dear child it is my part to ask your forgiveness not you mine my forgiveness oh for what can you require me to pardon you for not having sooner told you that you no longer owe the ogress anything that it rests only with yourself to decide whether you will henceforward make this quiet spot your home and cast off the garments you now wear for others my kind friend madame georges will furnish you with she is much about your height and can supply you with everything you require she is all impatience to commence her part of aunt i can assure you poor fleur de marie seemed utterly unable to comprehend the meaning of all she saw and heard and gazed with wondering and perplexed looks from one companion to the other 
as though fearing to trust either her eyes or ears do i understand you rightly she cried at length half breathless with emotion not to go back to paris remain here and this lady will permit me to stay with her oh it cannot be possible i dare not hope it that would indeed be to realize our castles in the air dear fleur de marie your wishes are realized your dream a true one no no you must be jesting that would be too much happiness to expect or even dare to hope for nay fleur de marie you should never find fault with an oversupply of happiness ah monsieur rodolph for pity's sake deceive me not you cannot believe the misery i should experience were you to tell me all this happiness was but a jest my child listen to me said rodolph with a tone and manner which although still affectionate was mingled with a dignified accent and manner fleur de marie had never previously remarked in him i repeat that if you please you may from this very hour lead here with madame georges that peaceful life whose description but a short time since so much delighted you though the kind lady with whom you will reside be not your aunt she will feel for you the most lively and affectionate interest and with the personages about the farm you will pass as being really and truly her niece and this innocent deception will render your residence here more agreeable and advantageous once more i repeat to you fleur de marie you may now at your own pleasure realize the dream of our journey as soon as you have assumed your village dress said rodolph smilingly we will take you to see that milk-white heifer musette who is to be your favourite henceforward and who is only waiting for the pretty collar you design to ornament her with then we will go and introduce ourselves to your pets the pigeons afterwards visit the dairy and so go on till we have been all over the farm i mean to keep my promise in every respect i assure you fleur de marie pressed her hands together with earnest gratitude surprise joy and the deepest thankfulness mingled with respect lit up her beautiful countenance while with eyes streaming with tears she exclaimed monsieur rodolph you are you must be one of those beneficent angels sent by the almighty to do good upon earth and to rescue poor fallen creatures like myself from shame and misery my poor girl replied rodolph with a smile of deep sadness and ineffable kindness though still young i have already deeply suffered i lost a dear child who if living would now be about your age let that explain my deep sympathy with all who suffer and for yourself particularly fleur de marie or rather marie only now go with madame georges who will show you the pretty chamber with its clustering roses and honeysuckle to form your morning bouquets yes marie henceforward let that name simple and sweet as yourself be your only appellation before my departure we will have some talk together and then i shall quit you most happy in the knowledge of your full contentment fleur de marie without one word of reply gracefully bent her knee and before rodolph could prevent her gently and respectfully raised his hand to her lips then rising with an air of modest submission followed madame georges who eyed her with profound interest out of the room End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven, Murphy and Rodolph. Upon quitting the house, Rodolph bent his steps towards the farmyard, where he found the individual who, the preceding evening, disguised as a charcoal man, had warned him of the arrival of Tom and Sarah. Murphy, which was the name of this personage, was about fifty years of age his head nearly bald was still ornamented with a fringe of light brown hair at each side which the hand of time had here and there slightly tinged with grey his face was broad open and ruddy and free from all appearance of hair except very short whiskers of a reddish colour only reaching as low as the tip of the ear from which it diverged and stretched itself in a gentle curve across his rubicund cheeks spite of his ears and en bon point murphy was active and athletic his countenance though somewhat phlegmatic was expressive of great resolution and kindliness of nature he wore a white neck handkerchief a deep waistcoat and a long black coat with very wide skirts his breeches of an olive-green colour corresponded in material with the gaiters which protected his sturdy legs without reaching entirely to the knee 
but allowing the strings belonging to his upper garment to display themselves in long unstudied bows in fact the dress and the whole tournure of murphy exactly accorded with the idea of what in england is styled a gentleman farmer now the personage we are describing though an english squire was no farmer at the moment of rodolph's appearance in the yard murphy was in the act of depositing in the pocket of a small travelling calèche a pair of small pistols he had just been carefully cleaning what the devil are you going to do with those pistols inquired rodolph that is my business my lord replied murphy descending the carriage steps attend to your affairs and i will mind mine at what o'clock have you ordered the horses according to your directions at nightfall you got here this morning i suppose i did at eight o'clock madame georges has had ample time to make all the preparations you desired what has gone wrong murphy you seem completely out of humour have i done anything to offend you can you not my lord accomplish your self-imposed task without incurring so much personal risk surely in order to lull all suspicion in the minds of the persons i seek to understand and fully appreciate i cannot do better than for a time to adopt their garb their language and their customs but all this did not prevent you my lord last night in that abominable place where we went to unkennel bras rouge in hopes of getting out of him some particulars relative to that unhappy son of madame georges from being angry and ready to quarrel with me because i wished to aid in your tussle with the rascal you encountered in that horrid cut-throat alley i suppose then murphy you do not think i am capable of defending myself and you either doubt my courage or the strength of my arm unfortunately you have given me too many reasons to form a contrary opinion of both thank god flatman the bertrand of germany perfected you in the knowledge of fencing tom cribb taught you to box lacour of paris accomplished you in single stick wrestling and slang so as to render you fully provided for your venturesome excursions you are bold as a lion with muscles like iron and though so slight in form i should have no more chance with you than a dray horse would against a racer were they to compete with each other no mistake about that then what are you afraid of why i maintain my lord that it is not the right thing for you to throw yourself in the way of all these blackguards i do not say that because of the nuisance it is to a highly respectable individual of my acquaintance to blacken his face with charcoal and make himself look like a devil no god knows spite of my age my figure and my gravity i would disguise myself as a rope dancer if by so doing i could serve you but i still stick to what i say and oh i know all you would say my excellent old fellow and that when once you have taken an idea into your thick skull the very devil himself could no more drive it out of you than he could by all his arts remove the fidelity and devotion implanted in your brave and valiant heart come come my lord now you begin to flatter me i suspect you are up to some fresh mischief think no such thing murphy give yourself no uneasiness but leave all to me my lord i cannot be easy there is some new folly in hand and i am sure of it my good friend you mean well but you are choosing a very ill hour for your lectures forbear i beg and why my lord can you not listen to me now as well as any other time because you are interfering with one of my short-lived moments of pride and happiness i am here in this dear spot where you have done so much good i know it your model farm as you term it built by you to instruct to encourage and to reward deserving labourers has been of incalculable service to this part of the country ordinary men think but of improving their cattle you more wisely and benevolently have directed your exertions for the bettering your fellow-creatures nothing can be better and when you placed madame georges at the head of the establishment you acted with the utmost wisdom and provident good sense what a woman she is no she is an angel so good so firm so noble and upright i am not easily moved my lord as you know but often have i felt my eyes grow moist as her many trials and misfortunes rise to my recollection but about your new protege however my lord if you please we will not say much on that subject the least said is soonest mended as the old proverb has it why not murphy my lord you will do what you think proper i do what is just said rodolph with an air of impatience what is just 
according to your own interpretation what is just before god and my conscience replied rodolph in a severe tone well my lord this is a point on which we cannot agree and therefore let us speak no more about it i desire you will continue to talk about it cried rodolph imperiously i have never been so circumstanced that your royal highness should have to bid me hold my tongue and i hope i shall not now be ordered to speak when i should be silent said murphy proudly mr murphy said rodolph with a tone of increased irritation my lord you know sir how greatly i detest anything like concealment your royal highness will excuse me but it suits me to have certain concealments said murphy bluntly if i descend to familiarity with you sir it is on condition that you at least act with entire frankness towards me it is impossible to describe the extreme hauteur which marked the countenance of rodolph as he uttered these words i am fifty years of age i am a gentleman and your royal highness should not address me in such a tone be silent my lord be silent i say your royal highness does wrong in compelling a man of honour and feeling to recall the services he has rendered to you said the squire in a calm tone have i not repaid those services in a thousand ways it should be stated that rodolph had not attached to these bitter words the humiliating sense which could place murphy in the light of a mercenary but such unfortunately was the esquire's interpretation of them he became purple with shame lifted his two clenched hands to his forehead with an expression of deep grief and indignation and then in a moment as by a sudden revulsion of feeling throwing his eyes on rodolph whose noble countenance was convulsed by the violence of extreme disdain he said in a faltering voice and stifling a sigh of the tenderest pity my lord be yourself you surpass the bounds of reason these words impelled rodolph to the very height of irritation his glance had even a savage glare in it his lips were blanched and advancing towards murphy with a threatening aspect he exclaimed dare you murphy retreated and said in a quick tone as if in spite of himself my lord my lord remember the thirteenth of january these words produced a magical effect on rodolph his countenance contracted by anger now expanded he looked at murphy steadfastly bowed his head and then after a moment's silence murmured in faltering accents ah sir you are now cruel indeed i had thought that my repentance my deep remorse and yet it is you you rodolph could not finish his voice was stifled he sunk subdued on a stone bench and concealed his countenance with both his hands my lord said murphy in deep distress my good lord forgive me forgive your old and faithful murphy it was only when driven to an extremity and fearing alas not for myself but for you the consequences of your passion that i uttered these words i said them in spite of myself and with sorrow my lord i was wrong to be so sensitive mon dieu who can know your character your feelings if i do not i who have never left you from your childhood pray oh pray say that you forgive me for having called to your recollection that sad sad day alas what expiations have you not made rodolph raised his head he was very pale and said to his companion in a gentle and saddened voice enough enough my old friend i thank you for having by one word checked my headlong passion i make no apologies to you for the severe things i have said you know well that it is a long way from the heart to the lips as the good people at home say i was wrong let us say no more on the subject alas now we shall be out of spirits for a long time as if i were not sufficiently unhappy i only wish to see you roused from your low spirits and yet i add to them by my foolish tenaciousness good heaven what's the use of being an honest man and having grey hairs if it does not enable us to endure reproaches which we do not deserve be it so be it so we were both in the wrong my good friend said rodolph mildly let us forget it and return to our former conversation you approved entirely of my establishment of this farm and the deep interest i have always felt in madame georges you will allow won't you that she had merited it by her excellent qualities her misfortunes 
even if she did not belong to the family of Arville, a family to which my father had vowed eternal gratitude. I have always approved of the sentiments which your lordship has entertained for Madame Georges. But you are astonished at the interest I take in this poor girl, are you not? Pray, pray, my lord, I was wrong, I was wrong. No, I can imagine that appearances have deceived you. But, as you know my life, all my life, and as you aid me always with as much fidelity as courage in my self-inflicted expiation, it is my duty, or, if you like the phrase better, my gratitude, to convince you that I am not acting from a frivolous impulse. Of that I am sure, my lord. You know my ideas on the subject of the good which a man ought to do who has the knowledge, the will, and the power. To succour unhappy but deserving fellow-creatures is well to seek after those who are struggling against misfortune with energy and honour and to aid them sometimes without their knowledge to prevent in right time misery and temptation is better to reinstate such perfectly in their own estimation to lead back to honesty those who have preserved in purity some generous and ennobling sentiments in the midst of the contempt that withers them the misery that eats into them the corruption that encircles them and for that end to brave in person this misery this corruption this contagion is better still to pursue with unalterable hatred with implacable vengeance vice infamy and crime whether they be trampling in the mud or be clothed in purple and fine linen that is justice but to give aid inconsiderately to well-merited degradation to prostitute and lavish charity and commiseration by bestowing help on unworthy and undeserving objects is most infamous it is impiety very sacrilege it is to doubt the existence of the almighty and so he who acts thus ought to be made to understand my lord i pray you do not think that i would for a moment assert that you have bestowed your benefits unworthily one word more my old friend you know well that the child whose death i daily deplore that my daughter whom i should have loved the more as her unworthy mother sarah had shown herself so utterly indifferent about her would have been sixteen years of age like this unhappy girl you know too that i cannot prevent the deep and almost painful sympathy i feel for young girls of that age true my lord and i ought so to have interpreted the interest you evince for your protege besides to succour the unfortunate is to honour god it is my friend when the objects deserve it and thus nothing is more worthy of compassion and respect than a woman like madame georges who brought up by a pious and good mother in the strict observance of all her duties has never failed never and has moreover courageously borne herself in the midst of the most severe trials but it is not to honour god in the most acceptable way to raise from the dust one of those beings of the finest mould whom he has been pleased to endow richly does not she deserve compassion and respect yes respect who unhappy girl abandoned to her own instinct who tortured imprisoned degraded sullied has yet preserved in holiness and pureness of heart those noble germs of good first implanted by the almighty if you had but seen poor child how at the first word of interest expressed for her the first mark of kindness and right feeling the most charming natural impulses the purest tastes the most refined thoughts the most poetic ideas developed themselves abundantly in her ingenuous mind even as in the early spring a thousand wild flowers lift up their heads at the first rays of the sun in a conversation of about an hour with fleur de marie i have discovered treasures of goodness worth prudence yes prudence old murphy a smile came to my lips and a tear in my eye when in her gentle and sensible prattle she urged me on the necessity of saving forty sous a day that i might be beyond want or evil temptations poor little creature she said all this with so serious and persuasive a tone she seemed so delighted to give me good advice and experienced so extreme a pleasure in hearing me promise to follow it i was moved even to tears and you it affects you my old friend it does my lord the idea of making you lay by forty sous a day thinking you a workman instead of urging you to spend money on her that does touch me hush here are madame georges and marie get all ready for our departure we must be in paris in good time 
thanks to the care of madame georges fleur de marie was no longer like her former self a pretty peasant's cap and two thick braids of light brown hair encircled her charming face a large handkerchief of white muslin crossed her bosom and disappeared under the high fold of a small shot taffeta's apron whose blue and red shades appeared to advantage over a dark nun's dress which seemed expressly made for her the young girl's countenance was calm and composed certain feelings of delight produced in the mind an unspeakable sadness a holy melancholy rodolph was not surprised at the gravity of fleur de marie he had expected it had she been merry and talkative she would not have retained so high a place in his good opinion in the serious and resigned countenance of madame georges might easily be traced the indelible marks of long suffering but she looked at fleur de marie with a tenderness and compassion quite maternal so much gentleness and sweetness did this poor girl evince here is my child who has come to thank you for your goodness monsieur rodolph said madame georges presenting goualeuse to rodolph at the words my child goualeuse turned her large eyes slowly towards her protectress and contemplated her for some moments with a look of unutterable gratitude thanks for marie my dear madame georges she deserves this kind interest and always will deserve it monsieur rodolph said goualeuse with a trembling voice you understand i know i feel that you do that i cannot find anything to say to you your emotion tells me all my child oh she feels deeply the good fortune that has come to her so providentially said madame georges deeply affected her first impulse on entering my room was to prostrate herself before my crucifix because now thanks to you monsieur rodolph i dare to pray said goualeuse murphy turned away hastily his pretensions to firmness would not allow of any one seeing to what extent the simple words of goualeuse had touched him rodolph said to her my child i wish to have some conversation with madame georges my friend murphy will lead you over the farm and introduce you to your future protégés we will join you presently well murphy murphy don't you hear me the worthy gentleman turned his back and pretended to blow his nose with a very loud noise then put his handkerchief in his pocket pulled his hat over his eyes and turning half round offered his arm to marie managing so skilfully that neither rodolph nor madame georges could see his face taking the arm of marie he walked away with her towards the farm buildings and so quickly that to keep up with him goualeuse was obliged to run as in her infant days she ran beside the chouette well madame georges what do you think of marie inquired rodolph monsieur rodolph i have told you she had scarcely entered my room when seeing the crucifix she fell on her knees before it it is impossible for me to tell you to describe the spontaneous and naturally religious feeling that evidently dictated this i saw in an instant that hers was no degraded soul and then monsieur rodolph the expression of her gratitude to you had nothing exaggerated in it but it is not the less sincere and i have another proof of how natural and potent is this religious instinct in her i said to her you must have been much astonished and very happy when m rodolph told you that you were to remain here for the future what an effect it must have had on you yes oh yes was her reply when m rodolph told me so i cannot describe what passed within me but i felt that kind of holy happiness which i experience in going into a church when i could go there she added for you know madame i know my child for i shall always call you my child i could not let her go on when i saw her cover her face for shame i know that you have suffered deeply but god blesses those who love and fear him those who have been unhappy and those who repent then my good madame georges i am doubly happy at what i have done this poor girl will greatly interest you her disposition is so excellent her instincts so right what has besides affected me monsieur rodolph is that she has not allowed one single question to escape her about you although her curiosity must be so much excited struck with a reserve so full of delicacy i wish to know what she felt i said to her you must be very curious to know who your mysterious benefactor is know him she replied with delightful simplicity he is my benefactor then you will love her excellent woman she will find some interest in your heart yes 
i shall occupy my heart with her as i should with him said madame georges in a broken voice rodolph took her hand do not be discouraged come come if our search has been unsuccessful so far yet one day perhaps madame georges shook her head sorrowfully and said in bitter accents my poor son would be now twenty years old say he is that age god hear you and grant it monsieur rodolph he will hear i fully believe yesterday i went but in vain to find a certain fellow called bras rouge who might perhaps have given me some information about your son coming away from this bras rouge's abode after a struggle in which i was engaged i met with this unfortunate girl alas but your kind endeavour on my behalf has thrown in your way another unfortunate being monsieur rodolph you have no intelligence from rochefort none said madame georges shuddering and in a low voice so much the better we can no longer doubt but that the monster met his death in the attempt to escape from the rodolph hesitated to pronounce the horrible word from the bang oh say it the bang exclaimed the wretched woman with horror and almost frantic as she spoke the father of my child ah if the unhappy boy still lives if like me he has not changed his name oh shame shame and yet it may be nothing his father has perhaps carried out his horrid threat what has he done with my boy why did he tear him from me that mystery i cannot fathom said rodolph with a pensive air what could induce the wretch to carry off your son fifteen years ago and when he was trying to escape into a foreign land a child of that age could only embarrass his flight alas monsieur rodolph when my husband the poor woman shuddered as she pronounced the word was arrested on the frontier and thrown into prison where i was allowed to visit him he said to me these horrible words i took away the brat because you were fond of him and it will be a means of compelling you to send me money which may or may not be of service to him that's my affair whether he lives or dies it is no matter to you but if he lives he will be in good hands you shall drink as deep of the shame of the son as you have of the disgrace of the father alas a month afterwards my husband was condemned to the galleys for life and since then all my entreaties my prayers and letters have been in vain i have never been able to learn the fate of my boy ah oh, monsieur rodolph where is my child at this moment these frightful words are always ringing in my ears you shall drink as deep of the shame of the son as you have of the disgrace of the father this atrocity is most inexplicable why should he demoralize the unhappy child why carry him off i have told you monsieur rodolph to compel me to send him money although he had nearly ruined me yet i had still some small resources but they at length were exhausted also in spite of his wickedness i could not believe but that he would employ at least a portion of this money in the bringing up of this unhappy child and your son had no sign no mark by which he could be recognized no other than that of which i have spoken to you monsieur rodolph a small saint esprit sculptured in lapis lazuli tied round his neck by a chain of silver a sacred relic blessed by the holy father courage courage god is all-powerful providence placed me in your path monsieur rodolph too late madame georges too late i might have saved you many years of sorrow ah monsieur rodolph how kind you have been to me in what way i bought this farm in time of your prosperity you were not idle and now you have become my manager here where thanks to your excellent superintendence intelligence and activity this establishment produces me produces you my lord said madame georges interrupting rodolph why all the returns are employed not only in ameliorating the condition of the labourers who consider the occupation on this model farm as a great favour but moreover to succour all the needy in the district through the mediation of our good abbe laporte ah the dear abbe said rodolph desirous of escaping the praise of madame georges have you had the kindness to inform him of my arrival i wish to recommend my protege to him he has had my letter mr murphy gave it to him when he came this morning in that letter i told our good cure in a few words the history of this poor girl 
i was not sure that i should be able to come to-day myself and if not then murphy would have conducted marie a labourer of the farm interrupted this conversation which had been carried on in the garden madame monsieur le curé is waiting for you are the post-horses arrived my lad inquired rodolph yes monsieur rodolph and they are putting too and the man left the garden madame georges the curé and the inhabitants of the farm only knew fleur de marie's protector as m rodolph murphy's discretion was faultless and although when in private he was very precise in my lording rodolph yet before strangers he was very careful not to address him otherwise than as m rodolph i forgot to mention my dear madame georges said rodolph when he returned to the house that marie has i fear very weak lungs privations and misery have tried her health this morning early i was struck with the pallor of her countenance although her cheeks were of a deep rose colour her eyes too seemed to me to have a brilliancy which betokens a feverish system great care must be taken of her rely on me monsieur rodolph but thank god there is nothing serious to apprehend at her age in the country with pure air rest and quiet she will soon be quite restored i hope so but i will not trust to your country doctors i will desire murphy to bring here my medical man a negro a very skilful person who will tell you the best regimen to pursue you must send me news of marie very often some time hence when she shall be better and more at ease we will talk about her future life perhaps it would be best that she always remained with you if you were pleased with her i should like it greatly monsieur rodolph she would supply the place of the child i have lost and must for ever bewail let us still hope for you and for her at the moment when rodolph and madame georges approached the farm murphy and marie also entered the worthy gentleman let go the arm of goualeuse and said to rodolph in a low voice and with an air of some confusion this girl has bewitched me i really do not know which interests me most she or madame georges i was a brute a beast i knew old murphy that you would do justice to my protege said rodolph smiling and shaking hands with the squire madame georges leaning on marie's arm entered with her into a small room on the ground floor where the abbe laporte was waiting murphy went away to see all ready for their departure madame georges marie rodolph and the curé remained together plain but very comfortable this small apartment was fitted up with green hangings like the rest of the house as had been exactly described to goualeuse by rodolph a thick carpet covered the floor a good fire burnt in the grate and two large nosegays of daisies of all colours placed in two crystal vases shed their agreeable odour throughout the room through the windows with their green blinds which were half opened was to be seen the meadow the little stream and beyond it the bank planted with chestnut trees the abbe laporte who was seated near the fireplace was upwards of eighty years of age and had ever since the last days of the revolution done duty in this small parish nothing can be imagined more venerable than his aged withered and somewhat melancholy countenance shaded by long white locks which fell on the collar of his black cassock which was pieced in more places than one the abbe liked better as they said to clothe one or two poor children in good warm broadcloth than faire le muguet that is to wear his cassocks less than two or three years the good abbe was so old so very old that his hands trembled continually and when he occasionally lifted them up when speaking it might have been supposed that he was giving a benediction monsieur l'abbe said rodolph respectfully madame georges has undertaken the guardianship of this young girl for whom i also beg your kindness she is entitled to it sir like all who come to us the mercy of god is inexhaustible my dear child and he has evinced it in not abandoning you in most severe trials i know all and he took the hand of marie in his own withered and trembling palms the generous man who has saved you has realized the words of holy writ the lord is near to all those who call upon him he will fulfil the desire of those who fear him he will hear their cries and he will save them now deserve his bounty by your conduct and you will always find one ready to encourage and sustain you in the good path on which you have entered you will have in madame georges a constant example 
in me a careful adviser the lord will finish his work and i will pray to him for those who have had compassion on me and have led me to him father said la goualeuse throwing herself on her knees before the priest her emotion overcame her her sobs almost choked her madame georges rodolph and the abbe were all deeply affected rise my dear child said the curé you will soon deserve absolution for those serious faults of which you have rather been the victim than the criminal for in the words of the prophet the lord raises up all those who are ready to fall and elevates those who are oppressed murphy at this moment opened the door monsieur rodolphe he said the horses are ready adieu father adieu madame georges i commend your child to your care our child i should say farewell marie i will soon come and see you again the venerable pastor leaning on the arms of madame georges and la goualeuse who supported his tottering steps left the room to see rodolphe depart the last rays of the sun shed their light on this interesting yet sad group an old priest the symbol of charity pardon and everlasting hope a female overwhelmed by every grief that can distress a wife and mother a young girl hardly out of her infancy and but recently thrown into an abyss of vice through misery and the close contact with crime rodolph got into the carriage murphy took his place by his side and the horses set off at speed End of chapter 11